All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, but the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. To Martha he said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Before we open God's word this morning, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we're thankful for this time that we have to come to your word, to open your word together, and to illuminate our thinking with the light of your word. Father, we're constantly reminded that this is not like any other book. This has been revealed to us by means of God the Holy Spirit through the prophets and apostles of Scripture who have written down, recorded, that which you have for us. It ha nothing in life has the importance, the significance, or the veracity of that which we read. Father, we pray that we might understand that it is through your word, the understanding of your word, that we are sanctified, that we grow spiritually, and that we are strengthened to face the challenges, the heartaches, the difficulties of life. It is your word that develops virtue in our souls and gives us the wisdom to live life skillfully. Now, Father, as we study today and as we reflect upon these events surrounding the death of our Lord, that you would give us insight into the dynamics of what's going on and help us to see the, and understand the principles that must be applied to our own thinking and our own lives. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Let's open our Bibles to Matthew chapter 26, verse 30 to begin. We'll start there anyway, and then we will move to some other passages. So you need to maintain a key level of flexibility as we study this morning. We'll be looking at several passages. This morning, what we're focusing on at this particular moment and Christ's ministry to his disciples is that he's going to announce their failure. He's going to announce that they will all leave him, they will flee, they will be scattered, and most of all, you're going to have Peter who's going to deny the Lord. Even if we remember what the Lord said about a disciple was one who would deny himself and take up his cross and follow him. And we see just absolute, total spiritual breakdown and failure on the part of the disciples. But it's not hopeless because God is never, never leaves us without hope, without a solution, without a remedy. So though there's failure, there's also forgiveness and there is a, a restitution to ministry for the disciples. It is all a picture of God's grace. And so often we can be very hard on other Christians who fail, but we all fail in many different ways. We deny the Lord by some of our sinful actions. We, it's more covert. We deny the Lord and at times maybe overtly, but whatever we do, whatever sins we commit, there's not one sin that you or I commit that isn't known just like these sins by God the Father from eternity past, and there wasn't one single sin that got dropped on the ground. They all got nailed to the cross. That certificate of debt was nailed to the cross so that every sin was paid for, so sin isn't the issue anymore. It's not what we've done when you're talking to an unbeliever. It's not the sins he's committed, the personal sins he's committed that's the issue. It's the fact that he is a corrupt sinner by birth condemned by Adam's original sin and therefore spiritually dead and there has to be that solution of spiritual life which comes only by faith alone in Christ alone. Now 
What we have done in our study of Matthew, last week we had communion, which coincided intentionally with our study of the institution of the Lord's table by the Lord Jesus Christ. It was both the, it, 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 in, in church history it's known as the Last Supper. It, it's not the Last Supper, it's the Last Seder. It's the last Passover in the age of Israel because everything we saw about the Passover meal is to foreshadow and teach about the necessity of the Lamb of God who's going to take away the sin of the world. It is that that is depicted by the Passover. So it's the last Seder, it's the last Passover, but it's the first Lord's table, it's the first communion uh, for the church. And so we see that at this point there begins a transition from the age of Israel to the age of the church. When we look at a plan of God for the ages, we broke it down into ages. You have the age of the Gentiles, then the age of the Jews, then the church age, then we have small uh, conclusion of the age of Israel in the tribulation, and then the messianic age. Each of those is further subdivided into dispensations. For example, in the age of Israel, it begins with God's call of Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, and we have a dispensation of the patriarchs that goes from Abraham to Mount Sinai. Then there's a transition, there's new revelation given in Mount Sinai in the form of the Mosaic Covenant, the Sinaitic Co Covenant, and the age of Israel goes from there until, I believe, the beginning of Christ's ministry. Now there's debate and discussion over this, but if you break down the categories of what makes a dispensation a dispensation, that there's new revelation, there's new expectations, there's new responsibilities, and there's a unique judgment, that fits that period of Christ's life. There's a new revelation. What is it? The Lamb of God, the second person of the Trinity, is in flesh among us. That's new revelation. He is the living word. There's a new responsibility. And that new responsibility is to accept him as the Messiah. And there's a failure, and the failure is the part of the Jews to accept that kingdom message, to repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And so there is a distinct punishment. And what was that? That is the removal of the offer of the kingdom and the postponement of the offer of the kingdom. And yet it will come again at some point. And we see that emphasized right here at the end of the uh, institution of the Lord's table. If you look at Matthew 26, verse uh, 29, when Jesus has just drunk of the third cup, the cup of redemption, he says to the disciples, but I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. As I pointed out last time, that fourth cup, which relates to the kingdom, was not taken that night. He stops after the third cup. And the point there is this isn't the end. He's still teaching that the kingdom is coming. And that idea of the coming kingdom that is not now but will be in the future runs through all of these conversations that are taking place still in the, as they're still in the upper room, as they're still gathered together. And it emphasizes the fact that there is hope confidence, a confident expectation of the future that God has a plan and he's still in control. And even though it may look as if he's lost control, the Savior is going to be arrested and tortured and crucified. Jesus Christ, we see from this passage, is still in control. He still determines what's going to happen. He announces what's going to happen. And he is completely in control. He's not out of control at all. So this emphasis here is another indication that the church does not replace Israel. For the kingdom that we have studied from the beginning of Matthew is a Jewish kingdom. It is a geopolitical kingdom that is centered in Jerusalem and will be ruled by a Jewish king, Jesus of Nazareth, the Messiah. And that that shows that this kingdom that he's talking about is going to come into come to pass. 
something is going to intervene between that point and the coming of the kingdom, and that's the church age, but the church doesn't replace Israel. The church is just an unforeseen aspect of God's plan and program because the Jews had rejected Jesus as the Messiah. So this shows that there is still that future and that hope for the nation in the kingdom. Now in Matthew's account, a number of things were said and done before they left the room, okay? I mean, a number of things were said and done, but they're not mentioned by Matthew. They're mentioned by John. John 13 and John 14, where Jesus is washing the disciples' feet and talking to Peter about um, the fact that if he doesn't let him wash his feet, he won't have any, any role or, or, or share in the kingdom, uh, what he says about, uh, about Judas, what he goes on to say that he's giving them a new commandment that you'll love one another even as I have loved you. And then he says he's leaving, and Peter says, well, where are you going, Lord? We want to follow you. And then there's a whole discussion after that in John 14 where Jesus says, in my Father's house are many mansions or uh, dwelling places. If this were not so, I would have told you. And he goes on in John 14 and talks about the fact that he's going to leave, but he's going to send another of the same kind, another comforter, to them, all of that still takes place in the upper room, but Matthew, Mark, and Luke don't mention it at all. Matthew and Mark give a rather abbreviated account of what happens when they finish with the Seder meal. They sing the hymn, part of the Hillel hymns, and then they go to the Mount of Olives. It's a quick summary statement. Luke adds a few things, and so we're gonna take some time to look at what Luke adds to this because it helps us to understand the more of the context of what Jesus is uh, when Jesus says that uh, Peter will deny him. So we're going to put these sections together. Now as we look at this, before we turn to, to Luke 2, I want to set up a couple of other things. In Luke 22, 24, it begins by saying that a dispute arises among the disciples, okay? And the dispute is, one we've heard before, who's gonna be the greatest in the kingdom? Now, some people say that this is just, you know, Luke didn't talk about some of the earlier ones and he's just sticking it in here. What, but it has a role, especially in Luke's narrative of what happens, Luke brings it up and talks about it because it helps set this context for, for the announcement of Peter's uh, denial. So we have to f understand the background on these, these uh, conversations about who's gonna be the greatest in the kingdom. And I want you to notice a couple of things. And if you want to turn with me back 10 chapters to Matthew 18. Matthew 18, the disciples are starting to have a little uh, disagreement among themselves. This is right after the Mount of Transfiguration when Peter and James and John have been up on the uh, Mount of Transfiguration, so the rest of them are getting a little jealous, and they've been having a discussion among themselves about who is the greatest in the kingdom. In Matthew chapter 18, verse 1, at that time the disciples came to Jesus and said, who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And then if you remember as we went through this, Jesus introduces the idea of being childlike. Many people miss the understanding of, the, um, uh, of that, that imagery there and that metaphor, but a child in that culture was not to be seen or heard. They were irrelevant. They were ignored. They were nobodies socially. And that's what Jesus is saying. He's not talking about being cute. He's not talking about being humble. He's talking about, you guys are concerned about who's the greatest, but you are nobodies. You are only what you are because of me. And you need to understand that your role is to serve the people, not to be somebody. And so, in verses 
3 and 4, he says to them, Assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted. Now, that's bad translation because most people think of converted as getting saved. And he says, unless you turn, unless you change your mind and become as little children. In other words, quit being arrogant and humble yourselves under the hand of God. He says, unless you turn and are humble like little children, you won't enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, as we've studied, entering the kingdom of heaven doesn't mean getting saved when you die and going to heaven. It means entering into the fullness and the richness of the kingdom blessings when the kingdom comes and having full rewards. And Jesus goes on to say, therefore, whoever humbles himself is as this little, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. The path to greatness is going to be being a servant. In other words, the, you think the path to greatness is, is self-absorption and self-absorption, and the path to greatness is giving all that up and realizing it's not about you, it's about God, it's about his plan for your life, and it's about serving him and his people. When you realize that, then you are going to be on the path to the one who's greatest in the kingdom. Now, what I want you to notice, though, is where this heads. It always seems to come back to Jesus and his mission when these topics come up. And he says for, in verse 11, For the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. Jesus, in his role as the Savior coming to serve mankind, to seek and to save that which was lost, is the prime example of greatness in the kingdom, the greatness of the king. It's the opposite of this mentality among the disciples. But as we've seen many times, they just don't get it. They, they haven't been able to get their mental fingers around this concept that Jesus is going to die and get buried and rise again. They, they you know, as we've seen, they turn to each other and they, what does he mean rise again? They, they just don't get it. They're, they're just lost. And then they go back to talking among themselves about who's going to be the greatest. Now, turn over to Matthew chapter 19. All of this section, if you remember when we studied it, relates to this idea of what it means to be childlike, what it means to serve the Lord, what it means to be truly humble. And the conclusion of this section takes us down to uh, the end of Matthew chapter 19. We have the whole episode with the rich young ruler who wants to know what he has to, what's the transaction, what's the contract I have to put into place to put into effect so that I enter into this eternal life. He wants a contractual relationship because he's, he's rich and wealthy and an aristocrat in this life. He wants the same thing in the next life. And so all of that conversation uh, that Jesus has with him is to point out the same flaw of arrogance that it's not about who you are, what your possessions are, or how great you're going to be in the kingdom. It's about serving me. And so uh, the disciples get it a little bit, at least Peter does, and he says, Lord, we've left everything. Just like you said to the rich young ruler, he needed to sell his all his possessions and um, give to the poor, and then he'll have treasure in heaven. And Jesus wasn't talking about becoming a Marxist, a communist, a socialist, and giving everything up or going out and being a mendicant in the desert or something of this nature. Jesus is pointing out to the fact that this guy's put his emphasis on the wrong thing. Peter recognizes that, and he says, well, we sold everything. We left our businesses. We left our homes. We left our families. What, what are we going to have? And... Um, and so Jesus then answers them and says, Assuredly, I say to you that in the regeneration, that's another term for the kingdom, when the Son of Man sits on the throne of his glory, you who have followed me will also sit on the twelve thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. What he's telling them is that's hope. He just told them that, yes, when I come in the kingdom, you're going to be on twelve thrones. You're going to be ruling over Israel. You may be failures. You may... Uh, fail me, you may commit various sins, you may deny me, but he's already told them what the end game is going to be, that they are going to be sitting on 12 thrones ruling over, over Israel. 
And so again, that comes back to him, but this, this issue continues uh, into the next chapter in chapter 20, gives the parable of the workers in the vineyard, which is teaching the same kind of thing. Then he predicts his death and resurrection for a third time in 2017 through 19. Notice that that's often in the context of who's going to be great in the kingdom. And then right after he says that in verse 20, the mother of Zebedee's sons, that's James and John, the mother of Zebedee's sons, we'll learn her name later is uh, Salome, came to him with her sons. Now, I don't know about you, but if my mother had done something like this, I'd be a tad bit embarrassed. But she's got James and John, little Jimmy and Johnny, you know, they're in their, he's probably, John's probably 19 or 18, and James is a little older, and she's dragging him up there, and she's going to pin Jesus and say, now, now, who, which one of these two sons is going to sit on your right hand, and which one's going to sit on your left hand? She wants an answer, and she wants it right now. And so Jesus then says, you don't know what you ask, and he goes on into this uh, discussion about the fact that they need to be able to drink the cup that I am about to drink. That is a picture of his suffering uh, for sin on the cross, be baptized with the baptism I'm bad baptized with, and they speaking out of ignorance. Ignorance joins with arrogance. Now, they're, they're, some people may say, well, their heart's in the right place. Well, that may be, but it's also arrogant because they're loyal. We do a lot of things out of loyalty that's also out of arrogance. And they're doing this. They're really loyal. To, I don't doubt their loyalty to Jesus, but they're arrogant at the same time. And they're saying, you bet we can do this. And they don't even have a clue what he's talking about yet. And so he goes on and he said, well, you will indeed drink my cup and be baptized with the baptism I'm baptized with, but to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but it's for those who's prepared by my Father. And then he goes on and we come to the end and he says, and whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. So what we see when these discussions come up about who's going to be great in the kingdom, somehow the conversation always gets turned back and Jesus relates it to his mission to sir, come and to serve those who are lost by going, going to the cross. So that's the backdrop. And then we have this third event that Matthew doesn't tell us about, but Luke tells us about, that they still don't get it. And in the middle of the the, the Seder meal, they start talking about, well, who's going to be great? See, I think it happens after Judas leaves. Judas has left. He's been pointed out that he's the bad guy. All that's left are the good guys. Jesus has just washed their feet and said, you all are all clean, indicating they're all saved. And so once again, they immediately turn to thinking about themselves. Now, I know that's not a problem for anybody here that none of us are quite that self-absorbed, but they are, and they were. And so we look at chapter 22 of Luke, and turn there now, and we're going to see what happens. And this takes place before they left the upper room, probably before they had finished the Seder and sung the last hymn. And so we're told in Luke 22:24. Now, there was a dispute among them. And it's an interesting word for dispute there. It, it literally has the idea, it, it starts with a pre, prefixed word of, of, from uh, philos to love. It's a lover of quarreling. Now, I don't think there's anybody here who loves just a good argument. I can look at two or three of you, and you love a good argument just for the sake of argument. You don't care who wins or not. You just want to debate. I'm a lot the same way. It's good to get into a good, intense argument, and we love it. And that's what they were. They're just loving this, this debate about who's going to be great in the kingdom. And that's in verse 24. As to which of them should be considered the greatest. And Jesus, it's right in front of him. And then he gives an illustration to contrast the attitude of the child of God 
who is on divine viewpoint with the human viewpoint that's expressed through all of the pagan concepts of leadership. And I, it's interesting, I've been to a number of leadership seminars and training things over the years since I was in ROTC in college all the way up, and I don't remember too many people talking about the fact that if you're a good leader, you're gonna be a servant of your men. Some of them will state it in different ways, but in a lot of areas, it's just a contrast. You, you hear their view on leadership. You're the one in authority. You take charge. You run things. And not that you don't. Jesus is not saying there's no authority, but he's talking about what the core attitude of leadership is, and he contrasts it with the rulers of the Gentiles who exercise lordship over them. This is a, another compound word, lordship, from the root uh, kurios, or the ver verb kurieo, which means to lord it over someone, to demand that they respect your authority and follow your leadership. See, that's, that's not what Christian leadership is about. You can apply this to parents and children. You can apply this to husbands and wives and fathers over the family. There's a lot of principles of application there. The rulers of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and those who exercise authority over them are called benefactors. We make, in other words, they, they make a special case for those who are the rulers. And then we have but in verse 26. And in verse 26, Jesus is going to contrast the divine viewpoint of leadership with human viewpoint. He says, but not so among you. On the contrary, he who is greatest among you, let him be as the younger, and he who governs as the one who serves. So he's telling them there are two different ways to look at authority and leadership. One's the pagan way, which is where you bring glory to yourself, and one is the divine viewpoint way where the glory goes to God and you're there to serve those uh, whom you're in authority over. Verse 27, he says, for who is greater? Now he's talking about who is greater according to divine, I mean, according to human viewpoint. Who's greater, the one who sits at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one, he who sits at the table? Yet I'm among you as the one who serves. Now, I get these emails every now and then. I really love them. They come up with some interesting facts. They'll say, did you know where this came from? And they talk about different phrases and words that come into English language. And according to this email, and I've read this before, so I think it's true, that back in the Middle Ages, most people didn't have dining room tables or even kitchen tables. They had just a table and a couple of, maybe, they didn't even have a table. They had something that folded down from the wall, and if they had anything, they had one chair. And the head of the household sat in the chair, and everybody else sat on the floor. If there was a guest that came and you wanted to honor the guest, then the guest sat in the chair and he took that position of authority. And so since it was usually a male, the person who sat in the chair was called the chairman, where we get our word chairman, okay? So this, this, this makes a little sense in light of that. The one who sits at the table, the one who sits at the head of the table, he's the one who has the authority and everyone serves him, but that's not how it is if you're a believer. He's there, but he says he's not the one sitting at the head of the table. I'm the one among you as the one who serves. That's my role. I'm not here to be served by you. I'm serving you. He's washed their feet. He does has served them, and so he emphasized that. But then he says something that is hopeful. See, first he corrects them that you guys are still all distracted by who's great and you have the wrong view of leadership and he says in verse 28 he says but but you are those who have continued with me in my trials so that's like Romans 8 talking about those who suffer with Jesus you've gone you are those who are st who are going with me in my trials and he says and this is the prophecy 
gives them hope. I bestow upon you a kingdom just as my father bestowed one upon you. So he's still talking about the kingdom. When they say, who's going to be greatest in the kingdom? Jesus doesn't say, you don't know what you're talking about. There's not going to be a kingdom. Or he doesn't say, well, we're just going to have this spiritualized form of the kingdom and it's all based on marks and we're all going to be equal. He doesn't say anything like that. He tells them that they're go there's still going to be a kingdom, it's yet future. They haven't quite got it all together, but we know that in Acts 1, just before Jesus ascends, they say what? Father, they say, Lord, are you going to restore the kingdom or establish the kingdom at this point? And he says, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons. So he said, I'll have a kingdom that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom, because he's the one who will be at the head of the kingdom because he's the king, and you will sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Yes, again, he emphasizes you will be ruling. There is going to be that reward for you, and you will rule over the 12 tribes of Israel. So what we see in, in Luke 22 that builds or sets the setting for what's going to come up is this, this discussion and debate about who's the greatest that was generated by the departure, by the departure of Judas. Now keep your place there and let's go back to Matthew 26 where we'll pick up the rest of the story. Just the, the few verses that I'm looking at this morning. And Matthew that is. Uh oh. There we go. Is that right? Matthew 26, 31, Then Jesus said to them, All of you will be made to stumble. Now they've just been talking about how great they all are and that each one should has, a, has, a, has evidence that they should be the greatest in the kingdom. There's nobody here that's saying, Nah, I'm just not good enough, y'all. Y'all debate this. They all think more highly of themselves than they ought to think. That's Romans 12, 3, that we're not to think more highly of ourselves than we ought to think. And Jesus said, all of you will be made to stumble because of me this night. And what he is saying is that because of what will happen to him when he gets arrested, those events are what performs the situation that sets up the circumstances for their failure. They'll be caused to scum, stumble. It's the word scandalizo. And this is also related to uh, the, the trip stick in a trap. Okay, sometimes if you buy a, a, a mouse trap, there's a little stick in there that if the mouse goes for the cheese, it flips the stick and the mouse is caught. Or you may have done something as a kid where you set up a box and you set up a stick. And if the bird got under the box, you'd pull a string that was attached to the stick and the box would capture the... That, that trip stick, that trip wire is the scandalizo. It's what trips somebody up and they stumble or they fall. And it's used to picture sinning or failing in the spiritual life. And he says they're all going to fail. They're all going to fail because of him that night. And then he quotes a scripture. He quotes from Malachi, uh, excuse me, quotes from Zechariah. Uh, quotes from Zechariah chapter 13, verse 7. Now, before I go there, what's interesting in this passage is that what Jesus does is to predict three things. He predicts that they're all going to be made to stumble and to scatter. He tells them, though, that there's hope. He says, but after I rise again, they still can't understand what that means. He says, after I rise again, we will meet in Galilee. That's in verse 32. And then he goes, will go on to say that Peter will deny him that night before the rooster crows. What we see before what we will see before we get to the end of the chapter is the disciples will be scattered. That will be fulfilled when we get to verse 56. The prediction of the post-resurrection meeting in Galilee will be fulfilled in chapter 28, verses 16 to 20. And the prediction that Peter will 
deny him will be fulfilled later on in chapter 26, verses 69 to 75. So again, Jesus is showing that he's a prophet. He is predicting in the near future that which is going to take place, and he is demonstrating that he is a true, a true prophet. And he quotes from he quotes from Zechariah. Now, if you go back and we take a look at Zechariah 13, we'll discover that this passage relates to the <coughs> Excuse me, it relates to the future for Israel. And if we read the passage in English translation, read it in the original Hebrew, or read it in the uh, Greek translation in the Septuagint, we'll discover that what Jesus says in verse 31 of Matthew, Matthew 26, doesn't fit. It's not the same. It's more of a paraphrase. He's taking a principle because that's what happens uh, <clears throat> that at the, in 70 AD, Israel is going to be scattered. And so many people take that as the fulfillment of this scattering image that they will strike the shepherd, which is Jesus, and then the sheep, which in the context of the Old Testament, that refers to all of Israel, and they will be scattered. And then it, Zechariah 13, 7 says, um, Then I will turn my, hand, turn my hand against the little ones. Now, we've studied this in the past. I don't want to take a lot of time to go through it, but there are four different ways in which you have this, the use of this formula, uh, this fulfilled the scripture or for it is written. If you go back to Matthew 2, you'll see various different prophecies that Matthew refers to uh, from the Old Testament. For example, that Jesus is born in Bethlehem, that's literal history, literal fulfillment. You have passages related to out of uh, uh, Egypt I called my, my son in, uh, in, in Jeremiah and, and in, in Hosea, or excuse me, that's in Hosea. And then in Jeremiah that the uh, children of Rachel are that Rachel is weeping for her children. And you have these different statements made, but, but only one of those, which is related to Jesus' birth in Bethlehem, only one of those is a literal prophecy. The others are either referring to something historical or they're referring to uh, a general principle. So what is going on here? It's that third use that we've studied in the past that Jesus is taking a principle that is... Um, alluded to here in Zechariah 13, 7, and he's applying it to this situation. He's saying, this is like that. Just as, as this is talking about um, the shepherd and the sheep are being scattered, this is the same kind of thing that happens. I will be struck, and the sheep, but he's not talking about Israel. That's the original context. He's talking about his disciples. They will be, they will be scattered. And then he gives this message, an indication of hope and a future. He says, but after I have been raised, I will go before you to Galilee. So he's, he's again emphasizing there's a future and there's a hope, but they're not comprehending it. They're not putting it together yet. But Peter says that Peter, what Peter hones in on is the fact that Jesus said that they'll be scattered. And he says, no, 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 not me. In verse 33, he says, even if all of you are made to stumble uh, because of you, I will never be made to stumble. And the way he's talking, he uses a construction in the Greek that says it's impossible. I, he, he just the strongest possible way he could deny something, he said, I'm not, not going to stumble. I'm not going to fall. I'm not going to sin. And then Jesus tells him in verse 34, assuredly, I say to you that this night before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Now we'll look at the details of that denial when we get there. Mark says before the rooster crows twice, and a lot of people try to say, well, there's a contradiction here. Well, let me tell you, folks, if a rooster crows twice, he's crowed once. There's no contradiction. 
Okay, so Jesus says, Assuredly, I say to you that this night, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Now, that's not all the Lord said. Now we have to go back to Luke 22. We go back to Luke 22 because Jesus talks to Peter about the dynamics that are behind this denial, that it relates to something much broader and it relates to the role of Satan in history attempting to uh, destroy the mission of the Son of God in <coughs> excuse me, in Luke 22. 31, the Lord said, this is in Luke, this occurs right after they've had the discussion and debate over who's greatest in the kingdom. And then the Lord says, Simon, Simon, indeed, Satan has asked for you. See, Luke left out some of the what took place between 30 and 31 because it didn't fit his purpose. The Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. See, here, this goes back to what we learn in Job, Job 1 and 2, when Satan has to go to God to say, see, you're, you're, see I, I want to test Job. And the Lord says, well, you can do everything, but you can't take his health. Then he's going to come back the second time. He's going to say, I want to test him some more. And he says, you can take his health, but you can't take his life. Um, Satan can't do anything without God's permissive permission. It's God's permissive will that allows him to do what he does, and so he's ultimately under the control of God. So Satan has asked for you, and the you there is a plural. It's for y'all, because what, P, what Jesus is pointing out is Satan wants to sift all of you, and then in Luke 22, 32, Jesus says, but I have prayed for you, singular, for you, that your faith should not fail, and when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. And so this reminds us that Jesus Christ is always praying for us, that this is a specific test for Peter, and that he is told that he will fail, but then he will come back and when he returns, he is to then strengthen his brethren. So throughout this section, we see the constant reminder that there's going to be failure, there's going to be forgiveness, and it's all based on grace, and there is going to be that future kingdom. So we're also reminded here that Jesus prays for them. Now, Peter is still arrogant. In verse 33, he goes on to say, Lord, I'm ready to go with you both to prison and death. And that's where the Lord says, I tell you, Peter, the rooster shall not crow this day before you will deny me, deny three times that you know me. Now, Jesus is the one who intercedes for us. In Romans 8, 34, we read, Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of the Father who makes intercession for us. And the point there is this, this rhetorical question, who condemns? How can anyone condemn a believer? Because Christ who died for us is the one who is constantly praying for us, constantly defending us at the right hand of the Father because he knows that we possess his righteousness. In Hebrews 7.25 we read, Therefore he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. The classic intercessory prayer of the Lord for us is in John chapter 17. It's called, that's the real Lord's Prayer. Not, not, Matthew, not Matthew 6, Matthew, I mean, uh, 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 excuse me, John 17, because there the Lord is praying for his disciples. Read that. That gives you an example of what Jesus is praying for for each one of us during the church age. And then we come to the conclusion in Luke, and this, sec this passage is only in Luke, and it's really a foundation for uh, self-defense, for the whole doctrine that the Bible teaches about self-defense. Jesus says to the disciples, he says, when I sent you out with money bag, knapsack, and sa uh, sandals, or without money bag, excuse me, when I sent you out without money bag, knapsack, and sandals, did you lack anything? 
So they said nothing. Now that's referring to back in Matthew chapter 10 when he is sending the disciples out to the house of Israel and the house of Judah and the marching orders there was don't take anything with you. Don't take bag, don't take your bags, don't take a lunch, uh, don't take uh, anything but your, your walking stick Did you? And, and God will provide for you on the, on the mission. And that's what they did. Some people say, well, this is a contradiction because there Jesus says, take, don't take anything here. He says, take something. But you have to understand it's different people, different time, different context. So now, because now that the kingdom has post, been postponed, the church age is coming in, they have a different mission. And now he says, he who has a money bag, take it with him. Take money with you. You're going to need it for the journey. And likewise, a knapsack, pack your bags and take what you will need for clothing along with you and for food also. And then he adds something. He says, he who has no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. This is a foundation for self-protection. It's a foundation for concealed carry because that's how they would carry it. And it's a foundation for, for self-defense that they would be attacked and they needed to be able to protect themselves. Now, I read one guy who said, well, this was, you know, Peter and John went in to prepare for the Passover and these swords that they had were just these uh, ceremonial ritual swords. That is not what the text says. The text says it was a machairos, machairos. If you want to know what that is, look in front of the pulpit. That is a Roman gladius, so that's the Latin term, same sword. Now that's, not, that's a little bit bigger than a Bowie knife. You're not going to be able to sneak that onto an airplane in your packed baggage, okay? They're going to be a little upset with that, but that's what they carried. And they would carry it concealed under their robes to protect themselves. That's how Peter was able to cut off the ear of the temple servant. He's, he's going to be armed. That's what they say. He says, sell your garment and buy one. For I say to you that this which is written must still be accomplished in me. And he was numbered with the transgressors. He's saying, it's still got to be fulfilled that I'm going to be uh, l lined up with the criminals and I'm going to be crucified like a criminal. And in verse uh, and, and then in the next verse, in verse 17, or excuse me, in verse 38, he says, uh, so they said, Lord, look, here are two swords. Same, same word. And he said to them, it's enough. He wants to make sure that as they go to the Garden of Gethsemane, they're armed. He has an armed guard. Now, why in the world does Jesus want an armed guard on the way to the Garden of Gethsemane? He wants an armed guard because he doesn't want anyone to take his life in any other way than going to the cross. He has to protect the mission, and if somebody, if, if, if they run into a Roman guard on the way and they decide to, and they attack him or something happens, he's got to be protected so that he survives to fulfill the Father's plan. And so he makes sure he's got an armed guard that will defend his life until it's the right time in terms of the plan. And then the last thing is said that is said, I believe, is what Peter says in verse 35. He says, even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And so said all the disciples. And it will just be a few hours, and they will all scatter, and Peter will deny him. We all sin, every one of us. Some of us have great failures. Some of those failures are in our past. Some of them are in our future. But there is always forgiveness because Christ paid for every single sin. It's all based on grace. None of it's based on works, and so we are not to judge ourselves or others on the basis of a works righteousness. But we are to judge ourselves in terms of confession of sin so that we can, we examine ourselves so that we can have forgiveness and continue to walk by the Spirit. 
with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. Father, thank you for this opportunity to reflect upon this episode, to come to understand uh, your grace as is exhibited by Jesus Christ, dealing with the disciples who still just don't really understand, don't comprehend, don't have a clue as to what exactly is happening. And we see their failures, but we're not a whole lot different because we have our failures, our weaknesses, and we often say we're going to serve you and apply the word and we're going to study the word, read the word, be in Bible class more often, and we fail. And there's forgiveness. Now that doesn't justify or uh, give in any way uh, condone our failures, but it is a way in which we can recover and go forward. And hopefully we will grow and mature as the disciples did and as Peter did to learn to serve you for that is the path of real greatness is to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God to serve you and to serve one another. Father, we pray that anyone listening today will recognize that salvation is not on the basis of works. It's not on the basis of your righteousness or your efforts. It's on the basis of Christ's righteousness. He died on the cross. He who knew no sin was made sin for us he bore in his own body on the tree our sin so that, by, so that it was paid for and that by believing in him we have everlasting life. Now, Father, we pray that you would challenge us with what we study today. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.